Let's get going here. Um, okay, so uh, looking at the uh, schedule, I'm um, going to be uh, going through a uh, couple things uh, this afternoon. I commented on them earlier. Um, uh, but I wanted to provide an introduction uh, to them first um, <clears throat> by uh, talking more broadly about uh, this term, oft overused, frequently hyped, but pointing to something um, of substance, which is um, big data. And we're going to be specifically talking about uh, big data um, in the context of health, uh, health behavior, um, and uh, cognitive areas of, of human behavior. So um, the term is, is a cluster concept that often refers to um, a uh, set of um, elect frequently electronic uh, data sources. Thanks, enormous. Um, a, a set of electronic data sources um, which uh, are listed before you. Um, we're going to be talking about several of those, um, including uh, the, the first two and uh, the, the, the final one. Um, but um, broadly, uh, within the past decade, particularly because of the growing sourcing um, of information electronically, uh, the emergence of uh, electronic health records, but also electronic uh, um, electronic uh, management systems for lab test results, Im imaging results, um, for uh, point of sale records, uh, for uh, for purchases, um, the growing emergence of sequence data, um, uh, both in terms of proteins and in terms of uh, genetic sequences. Uh, so nucleotide sequences uh, in terms of gene expression data over time, uh, communicational behavior. There's been a real upsurge in the amount of information that bears on an understanding of health behavior that is available electronically. Um, and when it comes to uh, health surveillance, when it comes to understanding patterns of health out there, um, there's a wide spectrum of opportunities um, to choose from uh, different data sources. Uh, and we're going to be talking within uh, this afternoon's lecture um, about several points on the spectrum. Um, on the one hand, uh, discussing um, from issues as coarse as monitoring search behaviors um, associated with uh, individuals' use of search engines to um, to find information online, um, proceeding through uh, monitoring of social media channels, particularly self-publishing platforms like Twitter, and then talking about mobile data collection, spending a significant amount of time with the uh, Ethica system that collects data from, um, from smartphones and these days from a growing number of wearables. Um, the spectrum here is one that is shown uh, deliberately for uh, a purpose. So we have on the left-hand side here somewhat coarser insights, uh, less longitudinal resolution at the level of an individual, although often uh, longitudinal and at an aggregate level, um, and it's less flexible. But at the same time, it's it's uh, it's recommended by lower recruitment challenges. We're dealing with secondary data that we can that we can uh, analyze. On the on the right-hand side here, we have finer insights. Uh, um, and it's more flexible, but also um, uh, there's need often to, to recruit individuals to studies and uh, to, um, to run studies in a way that will retain their adherence. Um, I noted this morning that um, uh, a, a important definition of big data, which is in my mind sort of the least bad one that I've yet seen, which points to uh, big data being distinguished by four primary characteristics. Uh, by volume, yes, that's the big and big data, but also I noted by velocity, the fact that it's coming in quickly over time. The fact that it's high variety, um, so it, it, it relates to a set of different uh, factors, often rather than, than just one factor on its own. Um, and uh, that often it picks up with physical measures, things that are subject to 
dicey or self-report, either due to reporting bias or recall bias or other factors, um, uh, but also because it allows for uh, uh, sort of triangulation. It's notable that um, these, uh, these, these middle two, velocity and variety, are particularly shared with, um, with system science models. System science models depict behavior over time at a fine grained level and often depict a wide variety. Alex, if you would mind uh, getting the, the door partially closed there, thanks. Um, also, uh, they, they capture typically a fair degree of variety in what's captured. They're not stovepipe models that focus only on one thing, but rather an interconnected set of factors. Um, and uh, in system science models, um, we're seeking to probe the underlying situation in a way that we aspire to with, in terms of veracity. So let's, let's just briefly walk through these things as a lead up to covering three of these methods. Um, so in terms of um, a volume, traditionally, um, you know, we've, when we've run epidemiological studies, often the number of participants is far larger than the number of, of records uh, per bits of information per participant. Um, with big data, we'll, we will often have a reversal of that, where the number of pieces of information per participant exceeds the number of participants in the study. That's not always the case. We always like to have higher, higher N as well to get a broader swath of society, et cetera. But there's no question that when it comes to collecting things like uh, accelerometers, um, but also things like GPS traces, um, uh, factors such as uh, step counts over time, incoming and outgoing calls, browsing behavior, you might have a very large number of records per participant that are featured. Um, and uh, you know, for, from the standpoint of traditional epidemiological volumes of evidence, you're talking about very large volumes of evidence, dozens of megabytes per day per person. Still less than you might get with a teenager on Saturday morning downloading YouTube videos. Um, uh, it, it's dwarfed in size. And that's an important point because data plans that accommodate YouTube surfing um, often will accommodate the needs here uh, very readily for connecting it from smartphones. But it's still a very large volume of, of data compared to traditional sources. And what's particularly notable is that the volume of data that we're dealing with here um, often requires different handling techniques, different methods for analyzing it um, than are amenable for traditional systems or recommended for traditional set of systems. And, and that does mean there are uh, different means of storage and analysis and visualization. Methods that we've used on small data sets often don't scale to this size. Um, uh, but uh, often because of the volume of data, we look for methods, for example, from visualization that might otherwise not be needed um, with traditional data sources. Um, I want to highlight that there's a certain quarter of, of, um, of uh, scientists who will point to this last feature as the defining feature of big data that, you know, it's, uh, we have to hand, it's, 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 distinct in, in an operational level that we have to handle it differently. And I'm, I'm cautious of that, because that changes with technology over time. Um, so often out of these studies, you know, we'll get millions and millions of records for uh, a period of a couple months of, of monitoring. This is one study uh, with um, uh, where we had uh, approximately 50 individuals, I believe, through the School of Public Health, and, and we were getting you know, uh, tens of millions of, of records across multiple, multiple measurements. Volume is the obvious, um, the most obvious one, and it's one that people talk a lot about, but I've argued that more, sub more um, interesting for our purposes is the issue of velocity. This data is often coming in at a rate that dwarfs the rate of arrival of traditional data sources. Um, and uh, it, it does span a variety of, um, of rates. Uh, there are uh, certain types of wearables. Uh, for example, the accelerometer on a Fitbit, uh, for example, where you might, uh, you might be getting 
quite a few measurements every second that go into the measurements. And uh, it is possible that with gyroscopes and accelerometers on phones that you can also get you know, that, that sort of level of, of resolution. Um, uh, we certainly get certain measurements on the order of, of seconds, uh, GPS devices perhaps every 30 seconds or, or, or every minute. Um, and uh, for, for other measurements, say Twitter messages or Facebook updates or browsing behavior, et cetera, might get many a day, uh, et cetera. But this is a lot better than you know, a quarterly self-report, or it's a lot more frequent than a quarterly self-report. Um, and uh, an important point here is that the variety provides high temporal resolution into micro behaviors at a level that are not sampled um, uh, by self-reported measures, which are, are more aggregate in character. So rather than asking, you know, in the past 60 days, how frequently did you visit the grocery store, we actually get pictures of their visits. Or instead of asking how frequently did you use e-cigarettes versus cigarettes in the past month, you actually get a picture of what people are using on an ongoing basis in terms of sessions of, of, of cigarette use. Um, or you get a picture of when they're actually taking their HIV, highly active uh, antiretrovirals um, during the day rather than just sort of reporting on, on how frequently did you remember to take them or what happened. So you get a very high, uh, high, high temporal resolution picture. And that picture can be related to what we depict in models, which is also often at a fairly high temporal resolution. Um, it turns out that for reasons we'll be returning to on Thursday, high velocity within a system science context often itself delivers high variety. Now that sounds bizarre, but suffice it to say, and I'll leave it till Thursday, that when you have very high resolution data sets and you have an underlying complex system that's coupled, knowing about one set of data with very high resolution will whisper to you about what's going on across many areas of the system. Okay. It will tell you something if you listen for it about what's happening in many different areas of the system. Particle filtering helps us get to the root of that and the techniques associated with this convergent cross mapping technique we'll talk about Thursday help us point to this. But variety at its most obvious level is also an important feature of these data sets. So, you know, often we'll have a given data set that provides multiple types of information. So, what we'll be looking at this afternoon with Ethica, where we capture location, physical activity, proximity perhaps, um, uh, humidity levels, responses to ecological momentary assessments from, from the same basic source for similar time stamp, same person, it gives a, a variety of, of insights. Or consider smartwatches, uh, maybe the Fitbits, with that, with it, which Ethica is now set up to use and read data directly into it, where you can measure sleep, and you can measure um, step counts, and you can measure um, uh, heart rate for the same person over time. Okay. Um, so increasingly, for a given participant, we, we have multiple sources of data available from these different measurements, from a smartphone, from a smartwatch, from knowing about their location and how it exposes them to weather, from, from weather-related information, maybe point of sale purchases and Facebook updates. So for a consenting individual who's willing to share some of this, it provides a kind of multi-dimensional picture on what's going on that can then be often analogized to what we're getting from models. It can help us point to help uh, challenge or support um, uh, modeling evidence. And what's very important is this evidence is cross-linked. So it's for a given participant in a given time, we'll often have multiple types of information. Okay. So we, we get this kind of multi-dimensional picture of their communicational behavior based on their context and their physical activity. Uh, as it's influenced by those around them. So we'll get pictures, you know, conceptually like this, um, where, you know, for a given individual, we may have them 
engaging in behavior, such as bathing behavior in, in a, on a beach, um, and there's measured risk ratings for that section of the beach at different times where they are exercising, and therefore to which they're, they're exposed. There may be advisories posted or even closures posted, uh, which uh, they're, they're not, um, uh, they're not uh, listening to in terms of their bathing behaviors. And perhaps they have highly credible gastrointestinal illness reported at certain points. And we can see this kind of picture of day-to-day -day patterns that is uh, elicited from multiple types of measurements. Sometimes self-report, say on phone, sometimes as measured by environmental sensors or by um, uh, sensors off of water quality samples, like the measured risk rating, and then data from other sources, perhaps posted online, such as beach closures or beach advisories. So we get a, a picture over time of what's going on. Or maybe with respect to vector-borne illness, such as uh, tick-borne illness, well, if a picture of when a particular individual removed a tick when they reported a rash, characteristic perhaps of, of, of um, Lyme disease, um, when they encountered a, a Lyme disease advisory, when different levels of symptom appeared, and when they sought care, as determined by GPS or by self-report. So we can get these kind of views of the trajectory or biography of an individual by knitting together often different types of information on them mediated by, by different vices. And so we can get these kind of link pictures of you know, activity level over geography of our city or where people are engaging in social interactions during and after work as measured by proximity sensors on the devices coupled with uh, GPS sensors uh, from, from the same phones. Um, within computer science, um, uh, there's, uh, there's a rule that was coined after the inventor of Ethernet, Bob Metcalf, um, which uh, has been termed Metcalf's Law. And, and basically it argues that the value of a network rises not linearly with the number of people on the network, but, but uh, with the square of the number of people in the network, super linearly. So if you double the number of nodes in a network, you have more than double the value delivered. Um, and I would argue that it's somewhat like this for cross-linking data. By cross-linking data, often we can elicit um, something that's greater than the sum of the parts. It's, it's not just um, we get two two extra types of information, it's rather they can feed together to give a, uh, uh, a consistent picture of certain underlying behavior. We'll see that during the week, uh, and we will, um, we will see this in the form of, of uh, some of the discussions with Ethica. Um, the final component is, is veracity, and um, part of this is, is physical measures. We know since the, the NHANES 3 study that there's big gaps between, in self-report between what people report for physical activity and what they in fact engage in for physical activity as measured by physical sensors. For nutritional intake, there's a similar gap uh, between what people report and what in fact they do in terms of servings of fresh fruits and vegetables or uh, sugar-sweetened beverage consumption or what have you. Um, weight, there's also a disjunction between what people report and what people, what's actually uh, measured through physical measures. And with, when it comes to measuring these things, um, one of the interesting aspects of, of uh, big data sources, like smartphones, um, is that often we can measure them more accurately and with less burden on the participant by doing so automatically, say from a, a weight scale that sends the information via Bluetooth, or, or by having a person snap a photo of, of food rather than trying to describe what it is uh, that they're eating once a month. Um, or we can, we can measure with an accelerometer uh, their level of physical activity on a risk-mounted uh, wristband rather than having to ask them how much physical activity they get. And we can get back something that's more accurate than they would self-report and less burdensome. 
than they would uh, traditionally uh, deliver. So um, those, those ones I mentioned, physical activity and sedentary behavior, um, uh, aspects of uh, people's um, uh, dietary intake, uh, for example, um, these are just one of many. Um, we found similar things with location, a big difference between where people report being and where they actually are measured as being with GPS. Um, uh, in terms of contact patterns, our work suggests that often it's so burdensome to report um, contact patterns that uh, it impoverishes uh, without a lot of compensation the ability to collect data that way, but you can gather a lot of that information with automatic measures through Bluetooth beacons these days, etc. So when it comes to a lot of different factors, communication, social context, spatial proximity, physical activity, and sedentary behavior, location, decision-making rules, um, uh, self-reporting is, is often uh, challenging in its accuracy and its burden, and yet, Often these are key considerations when it comes to informing our models, when it can, comes to informing our, uh, our techniques. Um, so uh, within uh, this week's uh, sessions, we're gonna be talking about techniques that can, um, that can lessen that barrier by allowing recording at low burden and uh, comparatively high accuracy uh, things that would otherwise uh, might be prohibitive. This is an example of contact duration, which we've measured. Uh, contact length for, between different individuals. Um, this is measured on a variety of data sets. Uh, these, the, the first and the final two are from our, our data. We've done dozens of these studies that have, have uh, included some measure of contact. Um, and uh, the Cambridge one is a, a different data set. But we can get this picture of how long people's contact durations are, how their social networks or their networks as induced by proximity change from week one to week two, for example, in a way that might bear on their, um, uh, on the risk to acquiring a, a communicable disease or in sharing of norms. Um, and uh, we can allow for reportings of foods, um, physical activity and barriers to physical activity. Um, now, so the point here is that individual measurements can sometimes be more accurate than self-report, but collectively, often we get a particularly strong picture. So often we can use multiple measurements, say an accelerometer and screen state and heart rate to infer things like sleep, sleep level at a much better level than we could with self-report or than we could with, um, with just one measurement alone or similarly with stress levels, or posture, or whether someone's indoor or outdoor, in vehicle or not, or whether they're smoking or not. Often, often by combining multiple ways of measuring things, we get this kind of multi-dimensional picture that with right machine learning algorithms allows us to pick out with high confidence what the, unlikely, what the, the underlying state is. Although any one measurement is highly fallible in this inference, jointly together with a tool like a hidden Markov model or a tool like uh, deep learning, you can often zero in on what the underlying situation is. The individual measurements are very uncertain, but collectively they have a real verdict that they give as, as to what's going on. So health big data that we're gonna be focusing on this afternoon. Some of its salient characteristics tends to be intensively longitudinal, available at an individual level. It's often accompanied by physical measures of certain things, location, proximity, et cetera, um, physical activity. Um, we can often link it to responses to ecological momentary assessments, um, characterize behaviors, but also exposures and outcomes along multiple causal pathways. This is very important. Um, so for example, we can ask, how does a presence of a service dog affect sleep quality for a veteran, but also how does it affect their likelihood of being of spending time outside the house, their likelihood of social contact, their likelihood of engaging with other veterans? To what degree 
Uh, is it leading to more structuring of their day-to-day -day patterning? We can, we can capture these sort of things that are otherwise hard to, hard to quantify. Um, it has sufficient temporal resolution to really lessen the impact of recall bias uh, compared to some uh, surveys asked, say, once a quarter or once a, once a month. We can ask in the course of the day about their recollection of, of their affect or about their uh, challenges. Um, and we could recognize many day-to-day -day patterns. And then um, the capacity to, to triangulate. And because a lot of it is automatically collected, it's lower burden. So these are some aspects of, of health big data that we're next going to explore. Okay? And we're going to be focusing for the balance of the afternoon on three major types of health big data. The ones, the ones addressed here. Search monitoring, Twitter monitoring, and, and mobile data collection. Okay. Any questions related to this material before we dive into these specifics? and we start to look at particulars. Question? Okay. Great, so what we're going to do now, um, having closed that, I'm going to ask you to fire